All right. Um, good morning. My name is John Sterling. I'm Senior Director of Research and Advisory Services with the Smart Electric Power Alliance. I am uh, going to talk today a little bit about a project that we launched a few years ago called the Pittsburgh State Initiative and the results of that project as we've moved forward over time. It's a little bit of a way of background uh, about uh, We are a 501c3 educational nonprofit. Our, uh, we've been around for almost 25 years now. We were founded uh, in the early 90s as a collaboration between the Department of Energy, um, EPRI, a large research institute, uh, some of the trade associations for the utilities and several utilities themselves. And the reason we were brought together was that those, those groups at the time noticed that uh, solar energy eventually was going to be a thing, uh, that a lot of folks were going to be adopting, and they needed a trusted source to go to for that resource. So we were founded to provide unbiased uh, education and research content, uh, primarily for the utility industry on solar. We have since expanded our mission earlier this year to cover other distributed energy resources like storage, demand response, electric vehicles, etc. Uh, we are a member-based organization. We have almost 1,100 members as of uh, today, uh, over 570 utility members uh, across investor-owned, cooperative, and public power utilities, and then um, nearly 500 non-utility members in, uh, from solar manufacturers and developers to consulting and engineering firms and regulatory commissions. Um, just as an example of some of the things that we do, um, we do a lot of research on uh, a variety of topics, uh, again, initially a lot of solar topics, and now we've moved uh, beyond that into storage and others. We also run several conferences every year for our members. So with that, let me jump into what the 51st state actually is. Uh, if you go back to around 2013 uh, and uh, the year prior, there was a lot of different activity around net metering and rate reform in some states. And most of those conversations were getting rather contentious uh, between the utilities and the solar industry. We saw a lot of uh, confrontations at regulatory commissions and not a lot of um, agreement and commonality on how to move forward. And so as part of that, we wanted to actually establish uh, some type of forum for different entities to come together and talk about rate reform and market reform but without any of the uh, hiccups that usually show up when you've got existing systems and existing utility structures. So that was the genesis behind the 51st state. Um, what we wanted to do was, was phase into the discussion. We wanted to start first and foremost with um, the hypothetical, what does the future look like, um, unburdened by any existing systems, kind of a blank slate approach. Move from there into more road mapping and discussions about how to actually make market transformation work, uh, and then finally, you would have uh, some basis to understand how to actually go about and do um, road mapping and transition work in existing jurisdictions. Uh, we, we recognize that um, the way our entity is structured, we really aren't the voice to come out and say there's one way to do everything and uh, here's sort of the path forward. We wanted to recognize that there's multiple potential outcomes in future states that folks should be considering. And so we crowdsourced this initiative uh, through both of the phases. We really, we should call for papers to look for industry experts to come together and let us know what they thought the future of the marketplace should look like. So uh, where did we start? Phase one started back in the fall of 2014 uh, with our initial call for papers. What we said was that pretend that uh, there's a brand new state in the union um, some of the federal policies would apply like the ITC and PURPA, but there's no existing uh, utility structure, no existing distributed energy resource market, state incentives. Um, so how would you go about creating equitable business models? How would you integrate the grid to make sure that you've got safe, reliable, affordable energy uh, while also meeting customer demand for distributed energy resources? So what would that structure look like? Uh, and beyond that, we really didn't put any restrictions on what we asked for participants to provide us. Uh, we, we only said, just let us know how different key stakeholders are going to be impacted, good, bad, or indifferent. Um, the utility, the grid operator, the, the DER customer, 
the non-DER customer, the regulators, uh, independent power producers, et cetera, what's their role? How are they going to be impacted? So that's how phase one launched. And we actually had over a dozen entities participate in that part of the process. Uh, from uh, the utility sector with uh, utilities like APS, trade associations like uh, the NRACA for the cooperatives, APPA for public power, but we also had the NGO space. Um, we had uh, universities like Pace uh, Law School participate um, and others. And so we had a very, very wide ranging set of ideas that came in. Uh, and I'll mention all of these are available on our uh, 51st State website. The, I'll provide the link to you later so you can pull up any of these papers. Uh, just as a way to show the bookended ideas that came in for us, um, NRECA, National Rural Electric Cooperative Association, um, they provided a submission that really talked about um, the cooperative point of view, cooperative utility point of view. Um, the idea that the future system should have a good mix of resources from a risk perspective, um, that we should be enabling uh, customers to make informed decisions uh, and that the the regulatory compact needs to exist to make sure investments that are made um, are reliable are affordable uh, are made in the best interest of customers and that the entire structure is there to help uh, the growth of the DER markets from that perspective so that's what we saw from from one group and if you look on the other end um, a little bit more radical of a proposal uh, came from Stoll Rives and Clean Power Finance um, Clean Power Finance, a, uh, a distributed uh, solar, a rooftop solar financing company. Um, John Wellinghoff uh, from uh, former FERC chairman and actually now at Solar City participated on this as well. Um, they looked at a, at a much more dynamic structure where the transactive energy framework was set up, um, where the utility is still owning and maintaining the grid infrastructure, um, but an independent system operator comes in at the distribution level to coordinate. Uh, DER planning and deployment. Uh, customers are able to adopt things like energy boxes that are um, managing load behind the meter on a real-time basis and interacting with the grid and the marketplace. Um, so very, very dynamic, much more akin to what I think uh, New York's rev process is looking like now. So very, very different model, more progressive model. Um, very interesting model that was uh, presented by them. And I think if you look across the dozen ideas that were submitted, they really sit uh, in two different buckets, and one that we would call incremental movement. So if you look at today's existing structures, um, you know, maybe some reframing of the regulatory construct, the principles of rate making, um, a recognition that moves towards innovative rate designs is gonna be needed, things like time of use rates, um, better articulation of what the monopoly utility would do in the future, um, and a real focus on customer adoption. We saw um, around half of the submissions come in in that frame of mind, uh, that there's some incremental steps that can be taken to enable the, the future marketplace. Uh, the other half of the submissions came in were real paradigm shifters, we would call them. Um, these were things that looked at uh, distribution system platforms, uh, inter integrating the consumer with the grid and real-time marketplaces. Uh, more transparency around distribution planning and operations and maintenance, the potential for third parties to step into that role. Um, we saw several several of the submitters talk about modification to the principles of rate making. Uh, you may be familiar with the Bonbright principles that have been around for decades. Um, several, several participants talked about modifying those um, to look a little bit more at, at societal impacts. Uh, and then lastly, these really talked about the customers being proactive decision makers and being much more engaged uh, in their energy future. So then, uh, so that takes us through um, the fall of 2014 up through 2015. Uh, we had all of these ideas out there that identified these future states, kind of what's the market going to look like down the road? And so then the, the challenge was to say, well, that, that's great. We've got this future in mind. How do we actually get there? Um, we are constrained by existing market structures, uh, utility designs, rate designs, um, market constructs. Uh, we do know that we've got to make some incremental changes to get there. And so the next phase of the project really focused on, let's identify some roadmaps uh, going forward. 
So we broke this challenge down into several different steps. This was a much more difficult crowdsource request, I think, than uh, what we did in the first phase of the project. Uh, the first thing we did was say, tell us about your current state. Uh, we didn't want participants to, to name a specific utility in a specific jurisdiction. That starts to get back into the issues that we had noticed years ago with um, uh, where, where you're starting to call out one specific uh, idea that you want to change, um, and it gets a little bit more personal in that manner. But this was really, you know, are we talking about a, um, an urban utility environment, or are we talking about a, a more rural uh, utility? Is this um, an investor-owned, a cooperative, or a public power? Uh, what kind of DER penetration do they have today? Um, are they vertically integrated? Is there a, a an RTO market uh, that exists, or is it still a bilateral market? Um, and, and what type of net metering policy is out there? What type of renewable policy is out there? So tell us kind of at a generic level where we're starting from. And then uh, where it got challenging is we actually broke down the uh, – this request into six different swim lanes. What we wanted to do uh, was put specificity around the future ideas and how complicated it was going to be to get there. Uh, and so we created these swim lanes, um, retail market design. We wanted, we wanted to have participants address to us how they saw the customer participating in the market. You know, were they opting into different rate designs? Were they opting out of them? How were their assets interacting with the grid? What were the structures there? Uh, we wanted to specifically discuss the wholesale market. We noticed in the first phase of the project, the wholesale market, um, relatively speaking, got left alone. There weren't a lot of discussions there. So we wanted to dig specifically into that. How, does the, the, um, how do the retail transactions of the wholesale market interact? How do DERs participate or not participate in the wholesale market? Who's responsible for some of that central planning? around generation and transmission. Uh, next, the utility business model. What's the utility asked to do? How are they asked to do it? How are they looking to recover costs and have a, uh, a long-term revenue model that's sustainable? Uh, what's their role going to be? Uh, next, asset deployment. What technologies are required to facilitate this future marketplace? Um, do, does this require things like smart inverters or AMI? Um, are there specific communication protocols and infrastructure that are going to be needed to make this future state work? If you think about that transactive energy platform uh, that had been proposed, very complicated system uh, that would require a lot of asset deployment. So what's that timing look like? Um, IT, so what software communication systems are needed? Uh, what are the protocols around that? What's the latency? And then lastly, rates and regulation. How's the commission uh, structure going to exist? Is it changing from how it exists today? What are the principles behind rate making? Um, how are those uh, being structured for customers and phased in over time? And, and you'll notice at the top here, um, we've, we talk about stages because one of the most important things that we wanted to push out in the idea of this project was that change has to be incremental. Change can't be immediate. And I think that's why we saw some of the issues in the past in different jurisdictions where a, a change to net metering was proposed and it looked like a very immediate impact and an immediate negative impact for some participant in the marketplace. Um, we think to get to these future states, you're going to have to very clearly define stages, uh, very clearly define checkpoints that, um, that let you know whether or not you can move forward. Um, you've got to have signposts that identify whether or not you have to change the path you're going down. So, for example, if you're going towards a more dynamic marketplace with real-time pricing, um, your first step can't, uh, can't necessarily be everyone's on real-time pricing. It's got to be some type of pilot, uh, potentially what are the communications infrastructure, metering infrastructure that's going to be needed, uh, equipment behind the meter for the customer that's going to be needed. Um, at certain checkpoints, how do you go to maybe an opt-in program before it becomes opt-out? So we were really looking to challenge the industry on thinking through the complexities behind uh, how market transformation is going to occur. And so we saw in this, uh, again, we had good participation over a dozen entities. Some of the same ones that participated in the first phase, uh, we're back again. 
Um, we see APPA and NRECA. Again, we had some new interest, new uh, new entries into this. Uh, several consulting firms like Accenture and Scott Madden participated. Siemens participated. Vermont Energy Investment Corp. Uh, Union of Concerned Scientists from the NGO space. So uh, again, some of the same participants, some brand new ones to come in and bring us ideas. Um, I will say this was a much more difficult challenge in that uh, we saw some of the submissions, uh, the original batch in phase one was averaged around 10 or 12 pages each, and these were 20, 30, 40, 50 pages long uh, that came in. Um, one thing to point out too, as we, we move from the conceptual to a little bit more specific in phase two, uh, if you look at sort of the word usage in the submissions that we received, uh, the thing that jumps out to me here is in phase two, you see the word utility pop up much, much more frequently. Um, a bigger focus on how the utility model is going to need to change and how the utility participation in the marketplace is going to need to change. Um, so that was something big that we noticed right off the bat. So I'll walk through one or two of the examples that we saw here uh, in this phase. Again, from sort of two different perspectives. Um, first, uh, APPA, the Public Power Utilities. Uh, they participated in this, and they've actually created a, an offshoot of our 51st state project called Public Power Forward that they're pushing out that leverages the work we've done, and now they're really using it to drive change in the public power industry going forward. But uh, in their current state, you know, they talk about their um, looking at their options and what their strengths and weaknesses are and um, some of the unique characteristics and restraints around public power utilities. Um, but they right away said there's some no regrets things we can do. Um, we should be looking at community solar. We should be looking at more uh, pilot programs on distributed energy resources and how they can integrate into the grid. We should be working more on outreach with our governing bodies and with our communities on what they're looking for. Um, and then they laid out sort of a future state perspective and where they want to go. And you can see they're looking more um, long term at how do we get to value based pricing? Uh, how do we push DERs to be deployed where there's the highest value to the grid. Um, we know in, in the public power industry they're gonna have to move towards um, new uh, investments in IT and, and uh, operating technologies. Um, they know that they're gonna have to update some of their business standards and learn how to better manage risk uh, in this dynamic marketplace with the wholesale markets. Um, so that's the perspective from, from one, uh, one specific entity in this. Uh, a separate one, again, I like to show sort of these two different approaches here. Scott Mann, which is a management consulting firm, um, they laid out a, a more detailed path for an investor-owned utility um, that's a distribution-only utility. So they participate in an organized market and there's some competition uh, for the retail load. And so in their vision, they're moving towards um, locational rate riders that, that identify the net benefit or cost to distributed energy resources at different points on the system um, and how both those assets can participate in the wholesale market as well as how that utility under codes of conduct can participate directly with the retail customer on offerings. And so uh, they laid out five stages around developing standards and protocols, codes of conduct, identifying that um, retail wholesale interaction and engagement, uh, reforming the rates and regulations, changing the utility business model, and then obviously iterate and improve. And, and you can see here how they've thought about uh, some of these checkpoints. What do we have to have in place before we can move forward? So um, just as a, a bit of a button on, on that, uh, we got submissions back uh, very beginning of March for this phase. And then in April, we held a summit. Uh, we had over 100 folks from across the industry that participated in this. And we really wanted to dig into the issues that were presented in the papers and identify um, how different entities in the room really thought, the, thought about those and process the information. So we see, um, we, we heard during that discussion that yes, new technology is coming. We have to be ready uh, to offer these uh, opportunities for customers so that they can be more empowered. Um, how do we get more customer choice into the equation? Um, but importantly, there was a big recognition in the room that regulators are going to have a lot more on their plate from a data ownership and privacy perspective, from a cybersecurity perspective, um, 
how to identify market manipulation issues that may exist in this more dynamic marketplace. So a big focus on making sure regulators are ready for this, but also on making sure that we're giving customers more options going forward. And I think I'll pause there for just a second. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, now, for those of you just joining us, uh, we are Blueprint for Clean Energy, the Yale Center for Business and the Environment webinar speaker series that invites leading practitioners and researchers in the field of clean energy to talk about the latest opportunities and developments in the space. Today, we're speaking with John Sterling, the Senior Director of Research and Advisory Services of Smart Electric Power Alliance, about CEPA's collaborative platform for electricity market reform. So far, we have discussed CEPA's framework for understanding the current market. And in the next 15 minutes, John will share more themes um, and discuss the utility and market transformation further. Then we will pose questions to John uh, for our Q&A session. Uh, we would like to remind our listeners that we welcome any questions you may have, so please add them directly into the Zoom Q&A window throughout the presentation. Thank you. All right, so um, I think from a timeline perspective, you've brought us up to about this summer. And one of the things that we as an organization did um, uh, for a big part of this year was to try to identify the common ground across all of the submissions that came in. Clearly, we saw a wide range in ideas and proposals um, from those incremental changes to very complicated uh, proposed market structures. But what we did notice is that there were some commonalities that were kind of behind the scenes uh, in each one of those, where we thought we could, we could pull out some very high level ideas that everyone could agree to, regardless of what their proposal and idea about the future was, um, that there was some commonality that we could draw out. We called those our doctrines, and I'll walk through those in a minute. And again, we think that um, each one of these is a major question to start off with uh, for any jurisdiction or group that's looking at talking about rate reform or market transformation, you can ask these questions um, or look at these statements and everyone have some level of agreement on them. Now, when you take it uh, one step below there, there's a ton of different outcomes and different directions that you can go um, from, again, the, the incremental to the transformational. Uh, and we're not suggesting that each of the items I'm going to cover here are required or that they're incremental steps that you move through. They're really like the buffet menu um, to where conversations can go to look and see where uh, individual entities stand and how they view um, these doctrines and the, the choices that you can make. Um, so they're not, um, there's no right answer here. There's no wrong answer here. I think a lot of these are getting deployed in different marketplaces already and so uh, the idea is to show we can find some common ground and agreement and there are some options out there that we can leverage from. So I'll walk through those right now. Um, here we go. Um, so the first one that we identified was on market efficiency and essentially it states that a primary goal of the market should be to promote, promote efficiencies in the production, consumption, and investment in energy and related technologies. We think that in general, everyone should be able to agree to that, that yes, we should be promoting efficiencies across the system. Um, so some different ways that that can manifest itself. Uh, the promotion of energy efficiency. Uh, you could look at creating energy efficiency standards, uh, incentives for different technologies and investments. Uh, you could look at decoupling um, or other ways to, to move the disincentive that could exist for the utility to push energy efficiency out the door. Uh, you could look at, at strengthening the resolve around investing in distribution automation, uh, looking at investing in more flexible assets on the grid, retiring core heat rate units. You could be looking at investing in two-way communications, um, AMI, DSCADA, Volvar control, things that are going to improve the functionality and reliability of the distribution grid. Um, and This could also manifest itself in real-time usage information for consumers where they can actually see in the real time how their uh, consumption looks, and that data would also be present for uh, the operators as well. And then lastly, uh, distribution system resource planning. We're seeing distribution system planning pop up in some places like California, New York. Um, SIPA's gonna have a paper coming out uh, relatively soon on those processes. 
Um, but you know, you can start with: Are you modeling DERs in your integrated resource plan? Um, how are those being treated? Uh, you could be looking at interoperability standards. You could be looking at long-term distribution planning becoming a key component of the IRP. Um, and you know, some uh, some jurisdictions and utilities are looking at predictive analytics. What is the likelihood that customers in certain spots on the grid are going to be adopting DERs? So again, um, some of these may work in some parts of the country. Some um, some maybe uh, wouldn't work quite as well, but they're all things that could be considered. Second doctrine is on the clear definition of roles. Um, the role of the utility as a public service entity should be clearly defined so that all market participants can understand their roles in enabling customer options in a fair, transparent, and non-discriminatory manner. Um, so this breaks down to a couple of things. First is, what's the utility structure look like? Uh, what do you want, what is it today? What do you want it to look like in the future? Uh, is it best to retain a vertically integrated utility? Should you be talking about a wires only or distribution utility? Um, does this future that you envision require an RTO ISO um, or uh, can you retain the bilateral market? And then uh, what's the utility doing? Are they that in the transactive energy framework? Are they the platform optimizer for DERs? Or do you need an IDSO to come in? Um, how does that break down? And then what's the role and responsibility on the utility? Are they the public service, full public service corporation? Are they a polar provider of last resort uh, in a deregulated market? Um, how should they be partnering with solution providers in the industry? Uh, and then, you know, are they integrating services? Are they allowed to offer direct services to the consumer in the future? What are the rules uh, of the road around that? Uh, third doctrine that we identified uh, is on rate structures. So what uh, rate structures should provide transparent cost allocation that supports a sustainable revenue model for utility services providing a public good. Uh, I think one thing that we've seen and heard now over the last few years of this project is everyone agrees that the utility will need to exist. Um, there is a public good service that's still being provided at least from a, an investment in the distribution system, investment operation and maintenance of distribution service. Um, at a minimum, that's gonna be required. The, duplicating that would not be cost effective. Um, what other services do they need to be providing in each marketplace? What, um, how do they recover the costs for the investments uh, and, and the expenses that they're incurring for that? So uh, this starts with the principles of rate making. Are, are the, is cost of service rate making that's existed for for a hundred years or longer, is that the right way to continue? Should there be some type of value-based rate making when you move to the DER transaction? Um, do you need to start differentiating time and location? Uh, if you look across many jurisdictions now, a utility can't charge a different uh, retail rate for a customer that lives in the, in a rural area compared to an urban area. Um, but uh, should you be looking at compensation for DER based on location? Uh, what are the principles behind the design of rates? Uh, today, it's predominantly variable rates. Uh, it's all kilowatt hour charges for the most part. Um, do we need to go to things like uh, time of use or demand rates uh, or minimum bills? Um, should those be opt-in or opt-out? Should they become the default down the road? Um, do we need to unbundle uh, the bill more in more detail to show how all of the different charges add up? Um, or uh, in some markets, is it right to go towards dynamic rate design um, on a day ahead or real-time basis, or, or is that going to be a little bit too complicated? And then lastly, around uh, the assurance of cost recovery, and this kind of goes back to that sustainable revenue model idea, um, do you need to have some type of formal approval of the resource plan or the action plan that it's based upon? Um, do you need to have some type of prudency determination uh, before investments are made uh, to provide that, that surety of recovery? Um, can the utility earn some return on energy efficiency investments that goes hand in hand with the idea of decoupling? Um, or do you go towards what they're doing in England, the RIA model performance-based rate making? So what, which ones of these ideas in whole is going to be the right way to structure rates over the long term? Uh, the last doctrine that we identified is on customer choice. And we heard this loud and clear um, customers should be presented with a variety of rate and program options that expand the choice and access to energy related products and services and that are simple, transparent, and create stable value propositions. 
Uh, one of the things that we heard uh, quite frequently, and specifically for the consumer advocacy community, was that um, whatever structure is put forward, yes, it needs to create options for consumers, but um, a large chunk of customers may not want to engage their utility in these manners. They may not want to be part of a dynamic rate design or adopting DERs. There could be a huge chunk of the population that's not interested in this and just wants to pay their bill once a month and move on. So whatever structures are out there, that, that's kind of a fundamental tenet that needs to be kept in mind. How do you make sure that you have simple and transparent, stable value propositions uh, for that customer base? But um, the idea behind multiple rate alternatives, you know, the, is there only one option, only one kind of inclining block or some other structure that customers could go on? Or are you creating multiple time of use rates? Um, are you changing your default option? Uh, have you looked at things like um, flat bills or dynamic rates? Um, multiple energy programs being offered. Uh, that includes community solar, for example, both utility-based community solar or third-party community solar. Um, are there demand response programs? Uh, is there ability to get to rooftop leases or PPAs? Um, has the utility done anything like online marketplaces? We've seen a few utilities that have created uh, online portals for customers to buy energy efficient technologies like smart thermostats. Um, how do those structures get manifest? Uh, increased transparency for customers uh, came up quite frequently. Are they able to see bill comparisons to show that a new rate, uh, what the impact's going to be, how they can manage their bill on the new rate? Are there any bill guarantees that uh, have a safe haven window? Um, we're going to show you what your new bill would look like, but it doesn't apply yet, uh, as an example. And then what type of uh, data access is available? Uh, Real-time data, data behind data, what can the customer see? And then lastly, how can we identify strategies to manage bill stability? So um, are there any rate case moratoriums that are going to be put into place? Are, how are you looking at consumer education and outreach? Um, uh, a lot of jurisdictions today have historic test years for how rates get designed. Um, does there need to be a shift towards what I would call forward-looking rate design? So these are all of the things that we pulled out of the do, you know, dozen submissions in phase one, dozen submissions in phase two, to say that yes, there are a ton of different ways the future marketplace is gonna get structured. Um, however, there are some major ideas that we can all agree to up front, and then some topic areas that we can all agree to discuss with it. And we do believe that that ability to find some common ground is important. Um, for what we would call kind of the hard part, uh, phase three, which we're starting to kick off now. This is where you take all of the ideas and you actually start to try to apply them. Um, so for this piece, really, I'm just going to focus a little bit on the stakeholder aspect of it because some of these ideas um, are not things that can get decided upon and generated in a vacuum. They would require regulatory activities. They'd require a broad uh, commitment from stakeholders to come together and discuss. Um, We've done a lot of stakeholder work at SEPA, and uh, I think from that perspective, whatever jurisdiction's looking at uh, taking some of the lessons learned that we've packaged together and moving forward, uh, we would expect that uh, neutral stakeholder facilitation is key. Having someone who can come in and um, you know not have a vested interest in the outcome uh, or a specific decision, but only have a vested interest in everyone agreeing on it. Uh, that's very important. Uh, we believe it's really important to articulate up front what the goals of the process are going to be, uh, what's the timeline going to be, what's expected from all of the participants going on. Uh, like I mentioned, a big thing that we would focus on is uh, identifying areas of agreement up front, uh, making sure that everyone can come to the table, find commonality, and where they think the future should be going and what they can agree upon, and then acknowledge, yes, we're going to have things we disagree upon, uh, but it's much easier to diffuse those and work through those if you've actually started from a basis of understanding. And then lastly, do, document the progress. Uh, these, these stakeholder engagement processes should be uh, jotting down at all times kind of the decisions that they've made and moving on and not revisiting them. Um, we proposed in our paper that we put out uh, just a month or two ago that uh, whatever this process looks like as you're talking about market transformation, um, you should have some core principles, uh, things like flexibility. Uh, you can't predict where the future is going to go. 
Um, you know it might change, so you need to be able to be flexible down the road with that changing technologies. Um, the future needs to be incremental. Uh, you can't make these giant leaps and go from um, all variable rates and there's only one option, so an inclining block to a future of dynamic rate design that's opt out. There has to be some incremental steps in there. Um, a big focus of the future needs to be affordability. Uh, you have to keep that focus on that not all customers are going to be adopting distributed energy resources, that whatever the future system is, it does need to meet the, that idea of affordability for all consumers, uh, and all meaning all consumers, not just the DER community. And then lastly, uh, transparency. There has to be a commitment on all parties that you're coming to the table and you're, you're showing your data and you're talking about the impacts of that data. Um, and then we would encourage groups that are that are engaging in these conversations to think about uh, two different time horizons. We spend a lot of time in our process talking about the roadmap, what the future looks like, very big picture, very directional, what are the stages that are going to be needed uh, to get to that future state. But importantly, there's also near-term action plans, very tactical in nature. Um, you need to be coming together as a group to say, here's what we're gonna do in the next uh, one to two years, here's the things we're going to come together and agree upon, and then that's going to start moving us down the road in the direction we want to go in, uh, but you've got those checkpoints to come back and make sure you don't need to change direction. Uh, so, you know, as a way to, to summarize, that, that covers everything we've been doing at SEPA on market transformation and on what the future should be looking like and how we should be, um, uh, we should be moving forward as an industry. You can pull down this information on our website, uh, sepa51.org. Uh, on there, you can see all of the different submissions that have come in, summary documents that we have, and our blueprint report uh, that is the basis of the last half of this presentation. Um, you can get that directly at 51st.report. Uh, that takes you straight to that link. Great. Thank you, John. Uh, we will jump straight into the questions at the moment. And uh, we have quite a few. Um, we'll begin with Robert Davis and um, his question to you. Uh, John, uh, what are your thoughts about a dramatically more distributed system, essentially working on a community level? A system without large scale power plants and replaced by a local grid on a scale of tens of miles. Do we, do we really need a utility structure at all? Um, so, I think that's interesting. I think that that's getting more towards the idea of microgrids. Um, we think uh, microgrids are going to become more prevalent in the future. There's a lot of different use cases behind those. Uh, we have a report coming out with EPRI in uh, December, I believe, or beginning of January on different structures and business models behind um, microgrids. I will say, I think what was learned at the uh, beginning of the 20th century around uh, economies of scale, I, I think may still hold true it, it, to some extent. Um, so at that time you saw you know, utility companies popping up and competing for load and, and you know, generators being blocks apart from each other trying to sign up customers. Um, and the, I think that central station, large asset um, economies of scale probably still has a place in the market. Uh, I think uh, certainly you know, bulk transmission still is gonna have a place in the market. Uh, the interesting thing is going to be how uh, the prevalence of distributed resources changes those dynamics and the types of assets that get deployed. You may see less of those traditional uh, baseload units uh, that are out there providing you know, 90% uh, capacity factor energy around the clock. You may see more uh, flexible units that are needed to manage uh, the movements of distributed resources throughout the day. Um, uh, on the second half of that, on uh, whether or not we need a utility structure, uh, I do think that a utility is going to exist. Now, it's going to look very different in rural America versus some of the more urban environments, um, but someone does still need to be responsible for uh, reliable delivery um, and uh, you know the grid, the distribution system, distribution transformers, wires, and meters. Um, so th from, from that perspective, I do think there's still going to be a role for the utility. Um, in different marketplaces, you may see that branch out. And in certain, certain areas, um, it may still make sense to have that vertically integrated utility. Um, and in other areas, you know, competition, retail market structures are going to make sense. We, we've kind of seen that 
uh, evolution over the last 20 or 30 years in the industry in the energy industry anyway. Um, and I don't see that fundamental uh, delivery piece changing. Oh, I, I think you're on mute still. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, great answer. Thank you, John. Uh, our next question is from um, Sean Breen. Um, John, can you uh, please touch on the vitality of non-residential and non-utility solar? Um, when, uh, when they account for a small portion of solar in the United States marketplace, um, they, they play a much larger role in Europe. So uh, do you think incentivizing investment in this sector could increase personal investment in non-residential uh, solar project uh, and boosting customer options? Uh, yeah, so I'm trying to think about the best way to approach this question. I think what you will see over the next five years, uh, proliferation and things like community solar or shared solar, mm -hmm. which fits um, a little bit into that space. Something like 99.9% .9 of all interconnections nationally are residential rooftop solar, right? Um, it is a vast, vast majority of the interconnections, but not the capacity. Uh, utility scale still, I think, leads the capacity market, or at least about half of it. Um, so we do see a move now towards community solar systems where it um, doesn't necessarily have to be community-based, but it's um, uh, assets where multiple participants can, can get their energy directly from one system, so like a one-to-many project. Um, if you look nationally, there's there's probably less than 200 megawatts of community solar on the grid today compared to tens of gigawatts of uh, residential. Um, it's got a real growth opportunity. Uh, so we, we do see that popping up. Um, you know, Europe, Germany had a lot of feed-in tariffs. Uh, they had, um, they didn't have behind the meter. So uh, a large chunk, at least my understanding uh, from when I went to Germany a few years ago to meet with their utilities, uh, a lot of the systems that were deployed interconnected directly to uh, the grid and weren't behind the meter. And so they just had a different style of deployment there because of the feed-in tariff system and how that incentivized uh, investments in renewables. Uh, so I, I do think that things like community solar, um, things like potentially uh, that same structure for the C&I sector, uh, where you can build a remote asset that's larger to bring it into one or a handful of CNI customers. I do think those um, are going to have a place and are going to be more prevalent over the next few years. Uh, I think that allows you to get away from restrictions that exist maybe on property or on roof space, take advantage of better locations and economies of scale. Uh, excellent. Thank you for your answer. Uh, our next question is uh, on uh, PBRs. So, John, could you elaborate on performance-based rate-setting conversation and which stakeholders are most actively involved in assessing and promoting PBR approaches? Yeah, you know, I would, I'd love to be able to answer this better. Um, I am not an expert on the, the performance-based rate-making uh, discussions that have been going on today. Uh, we saw that Rio model show up in Europe, uh, in England, and uh, there have been discussions in a few jurisdictions here. Um, why don't we can break it down into a couple of components? Uh, I guess first, there is an idea outside of the performance-based rate-making market where um, you know utilities historically energy efficiency has been kind of a difficult issue, right? Energy efficiency is the least cost resource in most instances, and it's good for customers and something to promote. Um, but it reduces sales, and so there is, uh, in some instances, a conflict of interest there. The utility's pushing something that kind of hurts the bottom line. Um, and so we've seen, one, decoupling come up, which helps solve that. And separately, we have seen discussions on utilities earning incentives on energy efficiency deployment, so that they're able to capture a return there, uh, and it re certainly removes the disincentive, and it helps them become uh, promoters. Uh, and so I think that's one thing, kind of on the outskirts of PBR, uh, that has been discussed nationally. Uh, if you go to our, our 51st State website and you look at the phase two paper by Accenture, uh, which is a large consulting firm, they talked about leveraging the Rio model. Um, and I think in, in their, their structure, they were, you could call it a hypothetical California utility is probably the basis of their, um, uh, their paper. Uh, but they do talk about moving towards transactive, uh, you know, 
transactive energy light, kind of a distribute the uh, platform enabler for the utility and uh, that utility earning performance based return. Um, so rather than me getting it all wrong, I would say go look at the experts from Accenture and how they categorize it. Sounds like a plan. Thank you, John. Uh, so uh, our next question is uh, on, on the rationale of thinking of energy as a marketplace. Uh, for instance, water is not thought of the same way. Uh, what is your opinion on, on actually looking at the energy space as a marketplace? Yeah, I, you know, energy, um, electricity has a few different things from water, and I'm certainly not a water expert, but um, it's much more transactive based, certainly at the wholesale level, um, with the prevalence of independent power producers, um, PERPA, QFs, um, you know, some utilities owning some of their assets, contracting for others. So certainly at the wholesale level, um, it's absolutely a marketplace. You're seeing transactions occur in the real time. Um, and if you really kind of dig down, we're seeing where I live in Arizona, um, one of the local utilities is actually um, backing down their own solar generation uh, during the day so that they can uh, take uh, take sales from California where the price for power is so low It's actually negative in California in some hours and so they're being paid to take energy uh, So we saw that pop up I think in the spring out here in Arizona. So certainly wholesale level is much more of a marketplace on the retail level a um, little bit a uh, little bit different you see in a handful of regions that have deregulated you know you look at Texas it certainly looks more like a marketplace there with uh, individuals competing for customer load. Um, and so I think that's why we talk about market transformation. It may not be the perfect word, but we are using it to describe what the uh, retail transactions are going to do down the road. Great. Uh, so our next question, John, uh, would be uh, about the stake, uh, stakeholders that you have uh, spoken uh, of previously in, in your research. Uh, which stakeholders are perhaps traditionally underrepresented in the discussions of market reform? And how has the 51st state initiative thought, sought to involve them? Um, I think the the first answer, probably the best answer, is the residential consumer, and specifically the uh, residential consumer who's probably not going to ever invest in things like rooftop solar. Mm -hmm. um, that burden usually falls to the consumer advocate uh, in, in each state and jurisdiction, and in my experience, that is a woefully underfunded group. Um, I think that uh, it would be beneficial to get uh, much more funding for consumer advocates in general to participate in more of these discussions right now. Again, my understanding is that they have to prioritize quite a bit with the limited funding they have and what um, doc gets to get engaged in at the state by state level. Um, so we did reach out to consumer advocates as part of our process. Uh, we had uh, we had some leads from consumer advocate groups at our um, summit earlier this year uh, ran our document that as we were developing it by them to make sure that their point of view was captured um, So we have been trying to engage that community as best we can. Uh, I think it's definitely a group that could be better engaged going forward um, That's probably the first and then I think you can kind of peel over to the small commercial from there um, Large industry often has uh, the ability to be engaged a little bit better than, um, than that small commercial sector Great. Have you also worked with utilities, or do you have any um, simple case studies or stories to share on that subject? So, uh, in, in each phase of our project, we created sort of a, an executive leadership group that helped guide uh, our work and how we looked at these issues. Mm -hmm. So, in um, in the first phase, uh, I'll throw some quick names out there. We had. Um, Jim Rogers, former CEO of Duke. We had Jigger Shaw, uh, former uh, founder of SunEd. Uh, Nancy Fun from the investment community. Um, Sue Tierney, um, who had uh, been at the DOE. And uh, one other name that's just, uh, Ron Benz, former commissioner from Colorado. Um, so they were looking at the papers that were coming in, help us identify you know, strengths and weaknesses there. Uh, second phase, um, we had a different group, larger group that came in. We had engagement from uh, the top level at several utilities, including um, Ralph Izzo from PSEG, uh, CO PSEG. Um, you know, we had Steve Malnight from PG&E. Uh, we had someone from Excel. We had uh, the public power of the co-op groups represented. We had uh, representatives from uh, the industry, 
uh, from uh, Nest, as an example, and from the solar industry. Um, we had uh, a VP from Walmart engaged on that panel to help uh, share the perspective of large customers. So we did the best we could to kind of broaden out. We also had um, Commissioner Champley, former Commissioner Champley now from the state of Hawaii, participate in that. And so we were really looking to broaden our horizon in phase two to make sure we were encompassing everybody's opinions and ideas. Um, from a from a case study perspective, that's what we're focusing on right now. What we're going to be doing over the next year uh, is pushing out examples from, from jurisdictions and states and territories where we're seeing interesting things happen on these discussions around rate reform and, and market reform. Uh, we're going to be engaging in some jurisdictions on those issues as well. So I'd say stay tuned from a case study perspective. Uh, sounds good, John. Uh, so uh, speaking of rate structures and customer choice, uh, we have seen significant pushback on net metering across several states. Um, against this backdrop, and given the fact that energy storage is becoming cheaper, what do you see as the future of net metering? Um, that's a good question. So um, I think the easiest way to answer it is that uh, you know net metering is a two minimum, and I don't usually like talking about it in general, but um, I think if you talk to enough uh, people in the industry and even utilities, net metering isn't the problem. Um, net metering is fine. The issue is the underlying rate structure. Uh, and if the underlying rate structure is way out of whack for how costs are, uh, cost causation occurs at the utility level, that's where net metering starts to become a pressure point. Um, so one, I would say it's the rate structure that we need to talk about. Um, for storage, I think the rate structures that work better for storage are going to be different than the ones that work um, for rooftop solar, and that's where the conversation is going to get really interesting. So um, demand rates, as an example, um, are something that um, are very difficult to make the economics work for a rooftop solar asset in some markets, but they're great for storage. They're very good at incentivizing behind the meter storage if the uh, demand rate window is is of a, an appropriate length. So I think that that's going to be the thing to watch in the future is how do these different resources behind the meter start to approach rate reform in the context of net meter. Uh, excellent. Um, so uh, John, as we think about the allocation of in investments in technology and clean technology, where do you think it should be uh, directed in relative proportions to developing cutting edge new technology for the future or towards scaling commercially viable technology in the current marketplace? Uh, you know, I think, um, I'm not sure how to answer that. I mean, as an organization, we don't really take a position on things like that uh, on, uh, on the right place for investments. I think from an R&D perspective, uh, it will be good for a continued focus on things like advanced inverter technologies and communication infrastructure. Um, I, you know, I think, uh, I think storage as well. I think those items that are going to drive 10 years from now, the, what the grid's supposed to operate like uh, are going to be key. Interoperability standards, I think, are going to be very important uh, down the road. Um, but as far as the specific investment in, in dollars and, and who's responsible for those, I'm not entirely sure uh, how that breakdown's going to occur. I think um, the focus of the DOE uh, in the next several years is going to be interesting as well to see how they shift around what their um, targeting from an investment perspective. Uh, excellent. John, uh, do, you, do you believe there is a market for uh, wholesale distributed energy? Uh, potentially. Uh, I think uh, that certainly if you look at the Scott Madden paper that was submitted in phase two, they talk about allowing uh, distributed resources to uh, participate in the wholesale market. I think it requires aggregation. Uh, I think if you look at demand response, and consider that a distributed energy resource, which we do. Uh, demand response has participated in the wholesale markets. And so um, the question is, how do you translate uh, rooftop assets into a similar structure? And uh, I think that is something you may see in the organized markets down the road. Uh, great, and uh, our final question uh, to you, John, would be uh, about uh, the future of, um, of the projects you have discussed today, uh, given uh, the current uh, environment, and where do you see things heading? Um, so, you know, I guess there's a few ways to answer that, but if you think about it in the context of the recent election, um, 
I think a lot of the conversations that are occurring and a lot of the policies that are going to drive the future are still going to be driven at the local and the state level. And so when you talk about, you know, you look at Hawaii and California and Minnesota and New York and all these other places that are talking about market transformation and what the future of their energy market look like, uh, it's full steam ahead as far as, as far as I hear and, uh, and talk to individuals about. Uh, I don't think anything's going to change there. Um, you know, federal policy, uh, the investment tax credit still in the book for a few years. Um, you know, beyond that, uh, things may or may not change. But I think really these discussions, because every, um, not only every state, but in many instances, every utility territory within the state is somewhat different and unique. And the answers are going to be driven at that level as opposed to the national level. There's really not one size fits all in this discussion. Thank you so much for, for your time, John. Um, well, that concludes our talk on the roadmap for electricity market reform. Uh, we appreciate you being with us today. Um, to our listeners, uh, you can view the recording of this webinar uh, on, uh, by visiting the events tab on the Yale Center for Business and the Environment website, or you can access the recording through the Yale iTunes University podcast. Uh, stay tuned for our next webinar coming up in January we'll be uh, having a discussion on transportation ESCOs with Bethany Whiteacre of Vermont Energy Investment Corporation. Thank you for joining us. Until next time. And this is uh, Anastasia Kirushkina from the Yale Center for Business and the Environment.